My name is Michael Savoldi. I was a professor uh, in animal and veterinarian sciences at the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, California. I was a farrier science instructor. I also was a resident farrier for the W.K. Kellogg Arabian Horse Center located on the Cal Poly campus. Our discussion today will be pathophysiology of the equine foot. Let me explain pathophysiology. It's two words, pathology, which is the study of disease and physiology, which is the study of the or living organisms and their parts. Our topic for today is the arch of the horse's foot. Now, this is a topic uh, not many people are familiar with, but we're trying to move our industry uh, into a modern era. And so we're introducing a lot of the things that occur within the foot in order to understand how to protect the foot and its health. So an arch in, uh, in uh, architecture is a very strong supportive feature. Well, the horse has a sole and that sole has different angles. And those angles can represent the arch in a, within the horse's foot. It's also to, important to remember that the shape of the horse hoof capsule will be determined and prescribed by the shape of the arch. So let's see if we can define the arch. We're looking at the bottom of this horse's foot. And now we can divide the foot into parts. If we were to put a transverse or a longitudinal line through the foot, we now can have a lateral arch and a medial arch. So how to do we define lateral and medial? Lateral would be furthest away from the center of the animal. Medial will be towards the center of the animal. Our next uh, area to discuss will be um, a line through, an axis through the center of the foot on a, a transverse plane. Now we can develop a toe arch and a heel arch. So there's four areas of the arch and we will consider these the main portions of the arch. But because the foot has many other areas, we need to discuss and, and those areas can collapse in their uh, sole angles. And so we will add the lateral toe quarter the medial toe quarter, the lateral heel quarter, and the medial heel quarter. So in our discussion, one could say the arch is collapsing in the toe. That simply means that it's failing, it's starting to flatten off, and vice versa for the, the other parts of the foot. Patterns found in feet that are functioning well. It's very hard for me to talk about a, a foot and, and call it a healthy foot because I've dissected feet for a very long time and I usually can find something wrong in every foot. So healthy feet to me are far and few between the ones that do not have pathologies. But a functional foot can be easily explained. So what we've done is over the years, we've noticed and observed different feet and we looked at the feet that are functioning well and the feet that have very little damage to the sole body and to the P3 bone. So looking at this foot up in this right hand corner, this is the same foot as you see dissected. It's a very young foot. I would call it a juvenile because once they start getting some time on them and body weight on them, the arch will start to co uh, collapse. Another key issue here is this foot has been trimmed to the sole plane. And that's what we see here. Trimming to the sole plane simply means taking length of wall away from the hoof capsule. And then uh, that establishes the true foot of the horse. So this foot has been trimmed to the sole plane. It's standing on its true foot. And now we can take radiographs and get a precise measurement of the plane of the P3 bone or of the angles of the P3 bone. If this foot should be untrimmed because of the unevenness uh, in wall length, that will shift the 
both the plane of the capsule around and it will also distort or shift the P3 around. And so those angles are really false angles. They'll all give us somewhat of an idea. But if we want true angles, we must have a base. And all my research is based on trimming to the trimming to uniform sole thickness or trimming to the sole plane. The trim is the same, they have different reasons. Trimming the sole thickness tells us that this sole, where it interfaces with the white line and the hoof wall, is fairly uniform in its vertical depth. Now I have to say, nothing's perfect here, so the sole's not totally uniform in its vertical depth, but it is close enough to use as a standard. Now the sole depth will, in this area, increase, and we will explain that in a little later discussion. So when we trim to the sole plane, we have a horizontally planed hoof capsule. How do we know that? Let's look at the sole plane. It's fairly uniform in its vertical depth. And so this horse is standing on its true foot. The next thing we would like to look for in a foot that's functioning well is a well is a well shaped arch that is holding the solar border of the distal phalanx above the proximal border of the white line. So this would be the, the distal phalanx or the coffin bone or the P3 bone, it has several names. But the distal phalanx will have a, a, a horizontal plane. This is very rare to find in horses. You can radiograph many, many feet and not see a horizontally planed hoof capsule, I mean a P3 bone. Well, that can be explained and I hope this talk will help explain why it's not horizontally planed. One of our goals would be to maintain a horizontally planed P3 bone because that distributes all of the stresses on the bottom of the foot evenly or hopefully evenly and then we have less stress to the to the soft tissue in the area. The next thing we said is that it's above the proximal border of the white line. Well, the white line has been removed off of this uh, sole body. And so we are now looking at the sole body and the, and the vertical depth of the sole plane. But we can see that it's fairly horizontally planed. So we have a horizontally planed hoof capsule with a horizontally planed P3 bone. An arch that is supporting a horizontally planed P3 bone. So again, this is a young horse. But look at the top line of this arch. It's horizontally planed. And as you can see, the P3 bone was fairly close to a horizontal plane resting on the top of this sole body. Remember that when we stand on our stand up from a sitting position and we have shoes and socks on, the first thing we notice is that our body weight is pushing the, our foot right to the top of the sole. The sock can, can, can become compressed. And if our foot moves around too much, you can see a wearing a wear spot in the sock. Well, that's the analogy I like to use for a dermis. The, the bone is standing on top of the sole. There's a dermis there. And when the bone moves, it can, uh, the weight can compress the dermis in certain areas. And when the bone moves within the capsule, it can wear, wear spots in the dermis and into bone. Again, gravity always wins. And then this arch can be found in front and hind feet, but very common in hind feet. I say that because front feet, the horses are usually standing. Stance is important to tissue development in, uh, in a foot inside this capsule. So if the horse is standing on the top of its sole, but the stance of the horse is moving back under the knee some, then you're going to have more stress on the toe area of your foot. They talk about center of uh, pressure. Center of pressure is all over the foot. It depends on conformation. So this horse would have more pressure in the, in the toe area if it's a front foot standing back. Now hind feet are primarily uh, standing forward a little bit ahead of the hawk. And so that bone is generally horizontally planed or in a negative plane position. That's just how they stand. And so because the bone is in a negative plane position, the arch in the rear portion of the sole body will, can fail. And you can see pathologies developing to the sole and to 
the um, dermis of the sole. Now we're going to take an example of foot shape associated with the arch. Let's look up here at the top, at the young arch that has a horizontally plane top line. We have two feet here. One is 55 degree angle and one's 45 degree angle. So, and this would have a, a, an toe angles. So we can look at the bone. We can lift the bone off of the sole body and we can see that the toe is different. This is a cartoon area. These drawings are easier to make our explanations and it is using a dissected feet. So we can see that the toe arch is collapsed where this one is holding. So as the toe arch collapse, then you will see the positive palmar angle developing maybe into a stronger positive palmar angle. Remember that we are working on a foot that has been trimmed to the sole plane a horizontally plane hoof capsule. That allows us to see, have more advantage to see what's happening in the foot. If we were to lift the bone on the 45 degree toe angle, we can see that the heel arch has collapsed. Body weight is descending more into the heel area. That will change the angle of the toe and that'll change the angle of the heel. So how can we help these horses? I'm going to mention a little bit about orthotics. An orthotic in a human foot does wonders for the body. Well, our industry now is starting to realize that this sole does move and that it needs some reinforcement. And an orthotic is a good tool to use for reinforcement, although it's critical on how we use them. Now I'm seeing more and more farriers putting orthotics in feet. But I question sometimes how they're doing it. You notice if we say use the word support, which is a word I cannot use, support the soul. Well, that's a difficult word for me to use because if you over support the soul, you'll have a, a sore foot. The horse will walk away a little sore. So I like to use an orthotic for um, a recoil action, which we will discuss later. Well, let's assume that we can take this foot the foot with the crushed toe arch and return the arch coming back so it looks more like this. Well, the bone, the bone, all tissue is connected, so the bone will have to change. The toe of the bone will come up. Well, that's what we're working towards anyway. Hopefully, we can achieve that. Once it's up, that'll change your hoof angle in the toe area. It will increase, it will bring, or decrease, it will bring that angle down, maybe to some people think 50 degrees is an ideal angle, but when you measure feet off of the sole plane, there's no ideal angle because all four, all four feet are different. So if you treat every foot independently when you shoe horses, you can stand a better chance to help in horses. So, but when you follow guidelines that all feet should be 50 degree toe, you're completely ignoring the important structures that lie within the hoof capsule. Remember that this soft tissue is delicate and it's sensitive and we must treat it with respect. I see a lot of farriers just trimming a foot like it was nothing and chewing a horse and going home, not thinking about the damage that they can be causing within the foot. And that's why we're trying to lay, raise the level for modern farrier science. So improving the top line of this arch will change the shape of the hoof capsule. Now we could do the same on the 45 degree angle. If we again look at our arch up here on the top, the decent arch, and if we could possibly raise the heel arch, what's going to happen to the P3 bone? It will go more to a horizontal plane. Once it's horizontally planed and give these feet the time to adjust, this toe angle will improve, it'll, it'll increase, it won't look so low, and neither will the heel angle because they all move together. So that's um, foot manipulation. Now, we're getting into an area that's critical and it should involve a veterinarian's help. You see, a veterinarian is well trained in soft tissue and how tissue heals and, and things like that. And he can be, a, he or she, excuse me, 
Uh, you notice how my eyes, when I get excited, they kind of go crazy? <laughs> well, who knows? <laughs> so anyway, it makes me laugh when I see that. Um, lost my thought there. Looking at my eyes again. <laughs> anyway, so the veterinarian is really, he that's his area, soft tissue and, da and, and tissue like that. So he can be a great aid to the farrier. And the farrier can be a great aid to the veterinarian. So when you start to work on horses like this together as a team and have a goal, work gets to be a, a quite pleasant when you can document your work and watch these changes take place. So farriers and veterinarians work best when they have a goal. So hopefully our industry will start coming together and start looking and figuring out what we need to do internally to these feet. Now, let's say that you have a foot that's a 55 degree angle and you have a foot that's a 45 degree angle. If those feet have a horizontally planed top line and a horizontally planed hoof capsule, then that's the way the foot should be. That's the way it is. But we're talking about collapse. To, we're talking about foot changes that collapse due to uh, weight bearing. So it's very common to be considered normal for these two feet, but it really is an unhealthy normal. So I'm going to look at three different uh, foot styles here, or foot shapes. You notice each one of these, again, it's a cartoon drawing because the points can be made a little clearer. But you notice the shape of this foot. It's, it's upright, straight sidewalls. This foot looks fairly decent. It's an optimal bone position, and this foot is the shape has changed. Notice that bone elevation. The higher the elevation of the bone is, the steeper the side walls will be. And the narrower the walls will be to the, the closer the walls will be to the foot. On a flat foot, the foot will be very wide at the bottom. Bone elevation is too low. So our terminology sometimes is sometimes they'll look at the bottom of this foot and call it a cup foot. Maybe it's a deep cup or a shallow cup like this one. But let's turn that, let's erase that word cup. It doesn't have a meaning. This horse has a deep, strong arch. I keep forgetting my cursor. This foot would have a deep, strong arch. This foot would have a shallow, flat arch. So let's try to throw out the word cup and start using the word arch because it has some meaning to our discussions. Here we can talk about hoof shape uh, with a deep arch. So we'll stay with this cartoon drawing and we'll look at some similarities uh, to, or thing, examples that can happen. Okay, the hoof capsule will be wide at the top and narrow at the bottom. Steep wall angles, bone location elevated, deep heel arch combined with a deep toe arch, usually a smaller narrow foot. Sole body on this type of foot, vertical depth of the sole. Here we look at the sole interface with the white line and, and the hoof wall. And we also can see the vertical depth of the sole body. Now it's rare for these feet to be equal or these measurements to be equal. They can vary. Uh, the vertical depth of the, this, this, the vertical depth on this foot can increase, can be unequal, but there's a reason for that and we will discuss that shortly. And this, the vertical depth of the sole here is dependent on a few things of, of what take, what's taking place. Uh, healthy feet, moisture content in feet, and things like that. So let's not get them confused as always being equal. I think of all the feet I've dissected, I've only seen one, one sole body that was equal to the sole connection to wall. Now let's look at the sole body uh, uh, with a deep arch. We're talking about 
the angle of the soul. So we said earlier uh, that the angles of the soul represent the arch. So this side of the foot has a fairly steep arch and this side. Um, if we look at the moisture line, uh, it doesn't really represent the arch very well. It can give you an idea. In other words, if the farrier cleans the foot out to the epidermal sole, it can have some variations in its vertical depth. So they're not getting a true representation of, of the arch. This is why it's important to work with a veterinarian because a veterinarian can use his radiograph equipment and look, because this is the area you wanna see when it comes to the arch of a horse's foot. You need to know the top line of the sole body. And here's what we're talking about as far as a deep torch. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we can do look at bone position on the sole uh, with a deep torch. So here again, we're looking at this steep angle. Another thing I would like to note before we go too far is all of the white that we see on this sole. That's all compressive load from the P3 bone. There's a dermis between these two, but it's a compressive load. And so the blood is being um, uh, altered in that area. It's very common. The bars are constantly weight bearing and the more forward pitch that develops on the P3 bone, the more stress you see on the top of the sole coming forward. And that's, well, um, well, that's how it is. Here's bone position within the sole. Now what's, what I'd like to really talk about this bone position on this deep arch is these two areas where the lines are. You see, here's the proximal border of our white line, and this is the distal border of our, our P3 bone. You notice the space that's running through here. There's a good space there. So that means that the dermis is free to have to, for blood to circulate, and that nourishes the sole body, and it also nourishes bone. Now we can look at this foot from the lateral view. Keep in mind this. Uh, keep in mind that this is our ideal arch, and this one is collapsing in the toe. And you can actually see the compression of the bone coming through the arch right through here. So all of this area that you see right here, the color, that's P3 bone loading that area. Another thing that we can see is this little dip that's developing right here, where the sole ties into the white line. That's uh, something you don't want to see, but it's extremely common. You see, there's things that happen in this foot that are naturally developing. Some of these things can make a foot lame. There's more things happening inside the foot to soft tissue and bone movement, making a foot lame than farriers. Very few lamenesses can stem from a farrier when it's compared to the amount of damage and lamenesses that can start from the internal portion of a foot. But so this this indentation is just a sign that the weight is pressing into the sole and it's, it's uh, dropping the sole a little bit in that area. Horizontally plane P3 bone with bone position. So now I can place the P3 bone on this foot and we can see that the bone is in a positive palmar angle with bone elevation. In this case, the bone elevation is more in the heel than it is in the toe because the bone's in a, a positive palmar angle. So if we were to radiograph this foot, the sole would appear to be thick. Well, we can look at radiographs or we can look at the sole depth. I have the ability here uh, that most people don't because I can take this sole and cut it right down through the center and we can see the vertical depth of the sole body in the toe area. That's normal depth there. That's, a, that's pretty decent. That's about what most of the soles run, run about, like that thickness there. And also we can see now the frog pad. I prefer to call the frog a pad because a pad has meaning. If we call it a frog, it's very easy to cut it out, 
cut it up, do what you want. But a, a pad has a, an important structure in a horse's foot. And it does have meaning. And we should protect it as much as we can and just try to maintain a good frog pad. I have to say frog pad because people are familiar with the word frog, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, the pads have meaning. And so we should just learn to manage the pad. This is the angle to our, our toe arch. And here we see the angle to the sole. There's our moisture line. So you see how it's critical to know this one will tell us, give us an idea, give the fairy an idea about the arch. This will give us a true, the veterinarian can verify the farrier's thought. Here's the frog pad sole junction, which I'll talk about later. It's kind of interesting because how it affects the change in a horse's foot on the sole area when it changes. An arched uh, hoof shape with a flat foot. Hoof capsules narrow at the top and wide at the bottom. A low wall angle. Bone elevation is too low. Exceptionally weak arch that has lost its recoil. Recoil is something that we should dedicate our work to, is protecting the recoil of the sole body. When the foot stands, when body weight stands on top of the sole, the sole flex down. And then when the pressure comes, when in movement, when the horse is actually in exercise, the, the sole will press even harder, It'll be more flexation. So the heavier the body weight, the faster the speed, more flexation in the sole body. Um, we know that because the dry sole has these cracks. Well, one should study the direction of the cracks. They're very interesting and they will tell you movement, internal movement that's taking place within the foot. So you want to be, if you're controlling internal movements, you'll be controlling some of those cracks. They may disappear on you or be much smaller. But this recoil is important. And when we talk about orthotics, the orthotic, one of the main portions of a good orthotic is the recoil action. Durometers in, in this silicone uh, putty come in different ranges. Most silicone putties that we use for as people call uh, support, uh, our 33 durometer. Well, that's a soft durometer. It works well as a cushion and does aid in, in recoil. But a 55 degree durometer uh, is a stronger durometer and it actually is more supportive for the recoil action. All of this tissue will, re will, will compress. You should never put a hard subject against the soul. Because how are you going to control body weight? Remember, when the foot hits the ground, the P3 bone lands on top of the sole and the sole is going to flex. If you don't allow that sole to flex, you've increased the collision point between the bottom of the P3 bone and the top of the sole. And what does that do to loading or damaging to the dermis of the sole? So you always want to let the sole flex and away, uh, move away from the descending load until everything stops. And then the recoil action will put the bone back into position. So I concentrate a lot on, on trying to improve recoil. And then this is just a large wider foot. So they can be too narrow at the top and cause problems, too wide at the bottom and cause problems too wide at the top and cause problems, too narrow at the bottom. See, wide tops and straight sidewalls are more um, associated with side bone. Thoroughbred horses, if you look at wide wide heels uh, on a thoroughbred horse, you don't really see a severe side bone in those. You can have them, but it's rare. But steep sidewalls with a positive palmar angle to your bone, you'll see a lot of side bone developing in those feet. So now we can discuss a flat wide foot. So again, here we see our sole, intercon our sole interface with the white line, and we can see this vertical depth of the sole body. And again, it's rare for these two areas to be equal. 
Note, sold below the proximal border of the white line. And that's what I was mentioned earlier, that you notice that our uniform sold thickness is not uniform through here. It's greater here than it is here. And there's a reason. The reason is, so oh, there goes my eyes again. <laughs> Damn it. Anyway, there's a reason because I get excited. You'd think after 50 some years of looking at feet, I wouldn't get excited, but they still get excited, excite me. Um, but the reason is the bones pushing down into this area or body weights pushing into the area and it's pulling the sole away from the white line or away from the wall and it's sink, settling in down here. So it's the same as that sitting in a hammock. When that happens, uh, inflammation occurs. This yellow that you see here tells the dark yellow that you see on this foot tells me that the dermis was stressed. The distal border of the dermis, when it's stressed, will scar. That scarring will increase this area in its vertical depth, but it's a terrible trade off because the sensitive lamina will decrease in its vertical depth. So as, and as that decreases in its vertical depth, then the bone starts to losing its edge. It will demineralize because of pilostitis. Pilos, yes. So what you want to uh, try to prevent is this area here from sinking. And that's very hard to do if you're just putting a horseshoe on a horse. Because a horseshoe with an open center allows all of this tissue, this movement to fall further into the, into the movement, and then it recoils back. So horseshoes are good for protecting feet and maybe developing something in the gates, but with that open hole in the center, uh, they can be detrimental for sensitive structures within the foot. Here you can see the, the curvature of the sole in this area here. I think I'll have a better picture there. So the sole angle, again, we're looking at the sole angle. You notice this angle is coming up here. This is a different sole angle than our previous foot because it had a steep sole angle. This has a flatter angle. Here's our moisture line. And there's how much the, the sole has collapsed. So there's very little um, arch in this foot looking at the bottom of the foot. A flat sole angle. Anyway, I just saw a ton of stuff. Anyway, you see how this angle is flattening off here? And you notice that over here, it's, it's not as different coming in here. It's a little steeper here. Well, what's flattening this again is the palmar process of the P3 bone and some of the ungual cartilages that are further back in the foot. That will, the bone is loading here. What's telling me that the bone is lowering in this position is the damage we see right here on this bar. And on the, you notice that the sensitive lamina on this foot has no color to it at all. It's crushed out. It's lacking nourishment. And the bone, P3 bone is doing that. It's the semilunar edge of the P3 bone that is loading the bars through this area. So as the bars crush, as this area crushes, then the bone lowers and starts crushing other areas within the foot. Even this side of the bar is lower than this bar. This one's probably on a radiograph would show you a horizontally plane bone, but if this was crushed down even more or had a lot less vertical depth to the commissure than this one, then your P3 bone could be in a roll position. It's common for us to alter the plane of the foot to adjust the P3 bone. But that's when you start moving into advanced farrier science, then you start to realize that by lifting this foot to adjust the plane of the P3 bone puts all of this material towards the load. It should get worse. The trick to fixing a, a P3 bone in a roll is an orthotic. You can adjust the P3 bone with an orthotics. Again, I wouldn't recommend a farrier doing this on his own. Maybe as we advance into this, as see, when you can get a farrier and a veterinarian to work together on this type of foot information, it really does bring them together. It gives them a goal and they both learn together. 
there's some lot of smart farriers and smart veterinarians out there that will learn how to adjust the P3 bone. You see, I can tell you, but the way I think is I'm not helping you by telling you to do that. It's, a, it's like giving an alcoholic booze all the time. You're not helping them, you're enabling them. So if I tell you how to do this, what are you learning? I'm giving you the basics. I'm trying to help you develop independent thought. I see a lot of people telling people, other people how to trim feet. A lot of people have this set trimming technique that, they, that you have to follow their orders. Well, that's okay. They, uh, they believe in what they believe in. But when they follow orders, what are they doing? They're missing all of this important stuff that we're talking about. This is what's important. Shoeing techniques can be changed to help the internal structures of the foot. So we have to work these things out. We have to learn. And <laughs> pretty sure we will. So here's our horizontally planed P3 bone. Now remember that there's a lot of tissue missing. And so this bone isn't as low as, it, as the photograph shows. There's a, a dermis that's in here and some dermises can be thick, some can be thin. Uh, there's a lot of tissue around here that's actually aiding in the bone position. So this is just for demonstration. It's just bone, bone low bone elevation. So the, on a radiograph, it will appear thin. The sole will appear thin. And we go back to the solar border of distal phalanx is below the proximal border of the white line. That is should be one of our main goals, is to try to prevent this from falling, from the bone settling down, trying to seek the horizon of the ground. It needs that arch, and it needs the arch to be protected. Looking at the side of this foot, and again, we can see all of the stress up. Look at our bar. <laughs> this time I didn't sit up and get eye to eye with the camera and say, look, look at the bar here. It's all crushed out, <laughs> which is <laughs> kind of common for me. I'm trying to be like low-key, everyday stuff, but it's hard. It's hard for me to keep this, my emotions in. Anyway, so all of this is crushed to the sensitive lamina to the bar. It's all coming from the P3 bone. This dip here is coming from the semilunar ridge of the P3 bone. Let's look here. This is a pretty decent ridge. This is collapsing and it's falling down. So I said that the other foot that had the collapsing arch like this, the bone was in a positive palmar angle. This bone could be in a horizontally plane P uh, palmar angle, be, uh, even though it has this dip, this flattening of the toe arch. The reason that is, I show, we talked about it, how the heel arch is failing and the bone settling down into here. I'll put the bone on this foot in a second. So here's our vertical depth to our sole connection to wall, our collapsed toe arch in the midsection. Now let's place the bone onto this foot. And you see the, <laughs> I love it. You see how the bone is falling between the bars. So this foot could actually have some depth to its commissures because the commissures aren't getting crushed. But the sensitive lamina is being totally dis destroyed. This horse probably is a good candidate for um, uh, corn, seed corn problems and things like that. This foot's a good example for quarter cracks. Things because all of this is affecting it. Uh, the quarter crack could develop, mostly quarter cracks are associated with length of wall in the heel. See, the corn is associated with length of the wall in the heel. I think I have covered that in another discussion. So, bone elevation. So, we'll put our, the, so the sole will appear thin on the radiograph. But if we look at the sole body, same sole, I just cut it, took it out, and cut it in half. Cut it longitudinally. Don't worry about this here. This is I drilled a couple holes in every foot. These holes are drilled into bone. I do one at the sensitive at the horny frog and one at the tip of the horny frog. I mean the sensitive frog. And I make sure the holes are into bone. And then when I clean the bones up, I can see how those things align. And it's um, 
it tells me rotation of the uh, uh, awing, how the capsule can all around the bone, can move around, drift around the bone. Because I've measured the point of the sensitive frog up to 18 degrees off center of the capsule. That's what these drills marks show me. So when you place a ruler down the center of a foot to say this is the center of toe, it will be for the center of the capsule. But I doubt that it's going to be that close to the center of the P3 bone because the P3 bone, the capsule can shift around the bone. I'm sorry, I got off subject. So here's our, our foot, our low bone position on a collapsed arch. We can see that the vertical depth of the sole is decent, pretty much like the other. Here's our, toe, our, our angle, and our toe is just flattened out. You can see how it's flattened out down here and here. Moisture line. And then, again, this angle is interesting, which we'll talk in just a few minutes. So here's like a review or conclusion. This is uh, our thick sole. This foot would radiograph, maybe referred to as a thick sole, but we can notice cursor. Here, here's, here we are, we have to repeat a little bit here, but um, this foot may radiograph and the term may be used a thick sole, but in reality, it's just bone elevation. And here's our sole thickness here, and it's not much different than the sole thickness on the one that would radiograph out as being called, referred to as a thin sole. It's just bone elevation. I mentioned these two angles here. When this angle changes, the frog gets longer or the frog pad gets longer, it gets pulled out. If you were to push down on this foot, this toe angle, this angle would change and this would pull out. Your frog would become more horizontally planed with the ground like this one is and it would get longer. So that's uh, just, I put these lines in here just to kind of show you that the descending load can really change the shape of the capsule in many different directions. Just look at this foot. Look, those holes I mentioned. Well, a handy thing about them is when I want to place the bone back on the capsule for a photograph, I just run a little drift pin through there, place my, through the hole, and then I place the P3 bone onto the drift pin and that's its location when I drilled it before I cut it apart. Look how, how far this toe is ahead of the bone. And that's because of the flatness of the sole. When the sole flattens off, it move, migrates it forward. The bone's not going to migrate forward. Just the sole will migrate forward. And you can see the steeper angle here. The, the steeper the toe arch, the closer the bone is, is to the toe of the foot here. So it's just the radiographs are revealing bone elevation. So I wish veterinarians would really start looking closely at bone elevation, look at foot shape, uh, excuse me, farriers and veterinarians, to start looking closely at bone elevation and look at hoof shape, look at the hoofs, and then look. At, there's a good way to document your movements here if you're using a two-state silicone putty. And that is when you put the putty in the first time, when you come back to shoe the horse, then you want to take the putty out to replace it, write the name of the horse and the date, and put it in a box. <laughs> and then once once it's in the uh, once you come back and redo, um, holy mackerel! I'm glad I wasn't sitting any lower in that chair. My head would be hardly over the table. <laughs> where, where where would I be? Anyway, God damn it, I got off track again. But keep those tracks. And then uh, two or three shoeings down the road, take that orthotic out and take the one out of the box and compare the dates. And you will see uh, uh, changes in these situations. So I hope that helps. Um, at least it's bringing uh, us, it's giving us a focus, something to look at and something to work at when we're shoeing horses. And it sets goals. These feet will change. You just have to learn how to have patience. If you're shoeing horses every five weeks plus, you're not going to see much. What are we doing when we shoe horses five weeks plus? We're helping the horse owner save money. That's all. Horses should be shot at a minimum of 12 times a year. That way we're helping horses. So... 
it's hard. I know that it's hard to tell clients that you, if you want a better, stronger foot, I'm not sure how my time is going on this. I think I have a few more minutes. Here's a little program you can do to evaluate how a feet can improve in a short period of time. Take a foot that's, well, take that flat-footed horse that you have right there. That might be hard walking on ground for a while. But take that flat-footed horse and trim it to the sole plane. Clean up. You don't have to massively clean the edge off around that wall because wall is important. And when they start taking so much a wall away and putting the horse on the white line, that's, um, in my line of work, I see the damages that that can cause. So just keep the wall from splitting. You don't need to dress the toe way back. Just trim the foot to the sole plane and uh, clean up the edges so it won't split. And shoot, have the horse owner walk it every day. I, if it's really a bad foot, one that maybe has been wearing bar shoes for a heck of a long time and nothing's changing, just hand walk that horse or a founder foot that you're trying to recover. Trim like I just said, have the owner walk the horse 60 minutes a day. If they have a hard time walking 60 minutes, have them walk it 10 minutes a day. Walk it till you know it's starting to become uncomfortable, then stop. But if it's 10 minutes, then do it six times a day. And in a short period of time, those feet will change so much on you that you won't believe it. They won't be pretty because you're not rasping. You're not using a rasp to make it look pretty. Just let the foot mature and develop the way it is and study it. And you'll see feet turn around very fast. Doesn't help to turn, it doesn't help a hoof to stand in a stall all the time or to turn them out in pasture. They need good trimming protocols of at least every two weeks if you're restructuring a foot. But so these five weeks and on and beyond in shoeing is only helping the owner's pocketbook. It's not helping the horse. So I've carried on a little too long and I want to thank you all. I hope this is going to be beneficial. I'm sorry for the little side um, destruction, the dis disruptions that I, I get to run off with on, but it's just hard for uh, when I see a picture. There's so much to talk about in those pictures that it's hard for me. <laughs> Anyone knows me, well, this is true. It's hard for me to really, really stay focused uh, on, on the lecture. It's just too much, too much involved. So again, thank you all. I hope you enjoy.